All right, we're continuing our series, Doctrinal Drift, and uh, tonight we're going to talk about the afterlife, so this should be interesting. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, though, I'm going to give you a little bit of a disclaimer. I've been doing this kind of throughout the series, but especially tonight. Um, since we had a storm yesterday uh, and the power was kind of off and on, I didn't get hardly any work done yesterday because of that. So I have not been able to put as much work into this teaching tonight as I normally would like to, and you probably don't care, but it bothers me that I wasn't able to put as much work into this. Um, tonight's topic, the afterlife, is a huge topic, especially when you're talking about what did Christians believe throughout history on that. There's a ton of work that goes into that, and I did as much as I could, and I just ran out of time at about 530 uh, this afternoon, I just quit and said, well, that's all I can do because I'm out of time. So I realize that I'm not giving you everything that really needs to be said about this topic tonight, um, but I'm going to give you what I have. I'll give you the work that I was able to to accomplish in a little bit of time on Monday and then all day uh, today. So um, if we end tonight and you think, well, that didn't really answer my questions, um, I'm telling you that ahead of time. Uh, probably not going to answer a lot of things tonight, but here's what, here's what we are going to be able to do. We're going to kind of get the landscape of what are the different issues and debates around how we understand the afterlife. We'll look a little bit at, at uh, church history uh, and see what people believed at different periods. Um, and I'm basically just going to throw a lot of terms and definitions at you, um, and we're going to kind of clear up some, some terms that we see in the Bible uh, about this issue. So... Um, so, like I said, we're going to talk about the afterlife, and this is way more complex than you think, okay? We tend to think of the afterlife in kind of simple terms, like, well, you die, and then you either go to the good place or the bad place, right? I mean, well, there's not a whole lot to think about. Um, or we have a lot of debates about what heaven's going to be like, or there's a lot of, you know, revival sermons about what hell is like. You ever been to those old-fashioned revivals? They preach on, you know, hellfire and then there's these elaborate discussions about what hell's going to be like, you know. So there's all those kind of things. But for the most part, we have in the West, uh, the modern West, we have a very simple view is that we die and then you go to the good place or the bad place and that's eternity, right? And we're going to find out tonight that it's way more complex than that. Um, there's, more, there's more spaces to go to, so to speak, uh, in the afterlife than, than just two. Um, and we're going to see that, and I'll show you that from the Scripture. So um, here's kind of how we think about it. This is the popular view, right? So you've got your earthly life, and then don't you love my fancy tombstone graphic. Um, so you're going to die at some point if Jesus doesn't come back first. Um, so you die, and then how we normally think of it, how it's most of the time described in our country, is believers go to heaven and unbelievers go to hell. Or you may hear it this way from people who maybe aren't as Christian as they like to think, they might say, well, the good people go to heaven and the bad people go to hell, right? And the people who say that are always in the good people crowd, right? I've never met anybody that says, well, I'm pretty sure I'm going to hell and I'm cool with that, right? So actually, I have met one person who said that, but they're actually now a Christian, so it's not true of them anymore. But, um, but that's kind of how we think about it. So, and, and it even gets so simple as people will say things Maybe not this way, but it'll get described kind of in this concept that you're going to die, and then if you have the right password, you get to go to heaven, right? There's that whole, you know, all the jokes about St. Peter being at the gate. He's going to ask you a question, and you have to answer it right and all that. There's nothing in the Bible about St. Peter standing at the gate, but um, makes for good jokes, I guess. Um, so this is kind of how we think about it. And we're basically either going to be in heaven or hell, until Jesus comes back and there's this final resurrection and judgment day. Uh, and then we go right back to the place we were already at. Anybody see any, like, how does that make sense, right? So basically you go to heaven and your, um, your spirit or soul is there without a body. Or you go to hell and the same thing's true. But in the resurrection, everybody gets a new body. And then you go right back to either heaven or hell. And that's kind of how we think about it, even though we might not chart it out like this. Um, this is kind of how we think about it. And we think our eternity for believers is in heaven. That's how it's often talked about. So most of the time, you'll hear gospel presentations. People will basically set up the story that if you believe in Jesus, you get to go to heaven, right? And if you don't believe in Jesus, then you get to go to hell. And uh, so... 
we've simplified it into this kind of thinking, and in the scriptures, it's there's more to it than that. Um, and especially on that ending part, I think a lot of people have that wrong. But we'll get there uh, as we, as we go along. Let me give you an outline for tonight. If you're a concrete sequential person like me, you kind of like to know where we're headed. So we're going to start with uh, some terms that we find in the Bible, and we'll talk about some translation issues with those terms. Then we're going to talk about some doctrinal terms. Those are always real exciting, right? Like terms like the intermediate state or uh, restorationism or eternal conscious torment or conditional immortality. You know those terms that you think about late at night and wish you knew what they meant. <laughs> now, that's terms I think about late at night. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we'll talk about some of those. That'll kind of help us see the different viewpoints uh, that, that exist. Then we'll look at some church history. That'll be rather short, and you'll see why when we get there. Uh, and then we'll cover some Bible passages. So we're going to kind of end with the Bible uh, tonight. And I want to, in that section, we're just going to kind of look at some passages and just say you might want to think about this or that. Um, so we're not going to answer everything for you tonight. We're just going to give you a landscape of things uh, to think about, which most of the time is frustrating for everybody. Welcome to Bible study. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so here's some biblical terms. We good? Everybody all right? All right. So uh, you've got heaven or heavens. Uh, both of those show up in the Bible, don't they? It's singular and plural in the Bible and sometimes used interchangeably, which makes it really difficult to figure out what exactly they're talking about each time. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's plural. So the first time you see the word heaven in the Bible, it's plural. And then in the creation story, there's not a point where he says, and this is when God created the heaven part that he lives in. It never explains that. It just says there's the heavens like where the skies are and the birds are flying and then there's the stars and you know what's out there uh that's kind of what the heavens are in the creation story so and then later you find out that there's like in the prophet Isaiah Isaiah chapter 6 he's he gets a vision of the throne of God and of course um he doesn't go oh wow this is awesome he actually responds by saying I'm ruined I shouldn't be here <laughs> right because God's glory and you know presence is there so um, so you've got that issue to think about. Then you've got this term that shows up in the Old Testament. It's a Hebrew word, Sheol. Um, and the Greek, uh, the Greek translation of that term is Hades. And that is not hell. Okay, Sheol, Hades is not hell. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, now, one of the reasons, this is just the place of the dead. So in the Old Testament, uh, if you die, if you're human and you died, which was everyone, except for couple. <laughs> um, you went to Sheol or Hades, right? This was the place where dead souls or spirits go, and they would wait for the, for the resurrection there. Um, so you'll read about this term. Now, the reason why you may not have heard these terms, you probably heard of Hades, um, because we say things like as hot as Hades out here, right? Because we don't, we're, we're good Christians and we don't say hell, you know? So we say Hades, but um, and by the way, if you go to the island Haiti, which I did recently, it was fun to say it's hot as Haiti out here. Anyway, so that was a funnier joke to me than you. But um, the place of the dead. So uh, you've probably heard of Hades, but you may have confused it with hell. And the reason why this commonly gets understood as hell is because the older English Bibles translated Sheol and Hades as hell in English. And that confused the whole issue because it's not the same thing, and we'll, we'll talk about that more. Uh, Gehenna is another term that's in your Bible, but a lot of your English Bibles translate it. That's a New Testament Greek word, by the way. Uh, it gets translated hell, like in the English Standard Version, which is what I teach out of most of the time. Uh, Gehenna gets translated as hell. Um, Gehenna, though, is the Greek term for the Hebrew phrase, the Valley of Hinnom, uh, which is a valley on the southeast side of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem sits up on top of a big hill, and there's two valleys. There's the Kidron Valley. Kidron Valley comes this way, and the Valley of Phenom goes this way. And um, this is the place that Jesus, every time Jesus is translated as saying hell, he's using the word Gehenna. Okay, It's used 12 times in the New Testament. 11 of those times, Jesus is using that term. Um, and James uses it 
once in the letter of James, but he just says the tongue is set on fire by hell. He's talking about how to be careful about what you say. And he uses the word Gehenna. No other New Testament writer uses the term Gehenna. Um, so there's a valley called the Valley of Phanom, and what happened there in the Old Testament, the Israelites were rebelling, and instead of uh, being true and faithful to Yahweh, they started worshiping a god called Molech, or Moloch sometimes it's called. And this was a big statue, a big idol uh, of this god, and inside of this big bronze statue, they would build a fire, and it had a big opening in the, the torso part, and its arms were out like this. And the way you sacrifice to that God to satisfy that God's wrath or get that God to do what you wanted is you put your newborn child in the arms of this hot statue and you let it burn to death, uh, alive. And uh, the priest of this God and all that, they would bang drums really loud to, to kind of you know, overpower the cries of the child. And the Israelites were doing that in the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, and what happens is as a result of this, God puts a stop to it because our God loves little babies. Yes? <laughs> so he puts a stop to it, even though it's his own people doing it, it's Israel doing it. He puts a stop to it by letting, the, letting them be conquered by Babylon, and in the result of that battle, scores and scores, multitudes of Israelites were piled in the valley of Hinnom and burned because they were killed in battle. And that becomes the kind of illustration of the eternal destination of the wicked or the lake of fire. Okay? Uh, so the lake of fire shows up in the book of Revelation. It doesn't show up other places. Now, it's kind of alluded to. You'll hear Jesus say things like the eternal fire. He's talking about this lake of fire thing. This is the final destination of God's enemies. Then there's another term that uh, you don't get because the English Bibles don't translate it. They just call it hell, usually. Um, but it's uh, Tartarus, and that's a Greek term. Sometimes it's also called the abyss or the bottomless pit. You've heard of the bottomless pit? Right, you see that in Revelation. This was kind of like a prison for evil spirits. There's a lot to say about this, but for sake of time, I'll just try to be quick. Um, do you all remember Genesis chapter 6? where the sons of God came down to the daughters of men and they corrupt humanity and it leads to the earth being filled with violence and everybody's, you know, humanity's about to be annihilated by them. You know, they're about to kill, kill each other off. Um, these rebellious sons of God are spiritual beings and they corrupt humanity. Um, and later on, if you keep on reading throughout the scripture, especially in Jude and Peter's writings, you find out that those spirits were kept in chains of gloomy darkness. And Peter uses the word Tartarus um, as, as the name of that place. Now, in other Greek literature, we know what that place was and what, how people thought about it. That was the place where the evil spirits in all the other religions, especially Greek religion, that's where they were sent. Um, so we're telling the same story, except there's different points to it. So in the Greek idea, the spirits who come down and teach humanity of how to make weapons and all this stuff, that was a good thing. The Bible is always saying, that was a bad idea. Those spirits should not have done that. And God has judged them and locked them up in the abyss, right? Uh, another example of this is when Jesus uh, meets a guy who's full of demons, the demon automatically knows who Jesus is, which is pretty cool, right? He goes, whoa, whoa, what are you doing here? Have you come to torment us before the time? So they know their time's short, Right. And um, this is where he's, you know, this is where Jesus makes a deviled ham. He sends them to the pigs, and they run off the cliff, right? So uh, before he does that, they ask to be sent into the pigs rather than into the abyss. We're talking about this place here. Um, so these are some terms in your Bible uh, that often get translated as hell, but they're actually different places. So like Gehenna and Lake of Fire, they tend to be synonymous. They think of those things as the same place. Um, the actual valley, Gehenna, is meant to remind you of what the eternal Lake of Fire is going to be like. Uh, and then Tartarus is this place for rebellious spirits. Have your eyes glazed over yet? <laughs> Maybe moving too fast here. There's more in your notes that I'm probably uh, leaving out uh, with scripture references and things like that. Um, so, I, I'm giving you that to let you know, in your Bible, there's not just heaven, earth, and hell. There's heavens, 
and there seems to be different parts to that. Um, there's, a, there's the space between earth and where God is, and those are all called heavens, okay? Uh, like you see the Apostle Paul talking about, I know a man who was called up to the third heaven, right? And he saw things that he was not permitted to say. So when somebody says they went to heaven and they came back and they write a book about all the things they saw, just don't believe that. Because if the Apostle Paul was allowed to see things and he, didn't, and he came back and said, I'm not supposed to say anything. And I'm just guessing that's kind of the deal, right? So I've never been there. If I was, apparently, I'm not supposed to tell you about it. So anyway, so who knows? I may have been, and I'm not telling you. But I haven't. Um, so it's more complex than just heaven, earth, and hell. That's my point, okay? So whatever you think you know about all that, I'm hoping that tonight you're going to go home thinking, I may not know what I thought I knew. And that's a good thing because it means we're, learn- we're starting to learn, all right? Here's some doctrinal terms, and this is going to be either boring or interesting to you. Either way, it's what we're doing. So uh, the intermediate state. So if you study theology at all, you usually will come on upon this term. This refers to the period between when you die and the resurrection that we're all going to experience. Good and evil, we're all going to be resurrected and judged, right? End of Revelation, right? Chapter 20. Um, the intermediate state refers to the time between your death and the final resurrection. What's going on during that time? That's the intermediate state. What state are we in in the intermediate between those two points? That's what this is about. So there's basically three main views and about um, a million additional views under the last one. (laughs) But we'll get there. The Eastern Orthodox view, this is the, um, in my opinion, the most ancient form of Christianity. Um, They believe that all the dead go to Sheol or Hades, that's the same place, just two different languages for the word, uh, to await the resurrection. Both the righteous and the evil experience a preview of their eternal destination. That's what the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, teaches and have been for nearly 2,000 years. Um, They teach that everybody's going to go there and waiting, and there's a good side of that and a bad side of that. And what you experience there is related to how you lived here. So if you were faithful to Jesus and you did what he told you to do and you produced good fruit, then you will have a good intermediate state. Uh, They take this from the the, uh, story that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus, which we're going to read later. Um, And so they, but they believe this is a preview of what your eternity will be like. So if you're on the good side, you're in the paradise side, then you're with Christ in some sense. And then that's kind of a preview of the new creation that you will inherit in the end. Uh, if you're in the, the not-so-great side, <laughs> uh, it's not good for you. Um, because if you read the story that we're going to read later about what Jesus told about the rich man, he was not having a jolly old time in Hades. He was having a difficult time. He was suffering. So that's like a preview of your eternal destination. That's the Eastern Orthodox view. The Catholic view is purgatory. So they came up with a whole new place. <laughs> because I guess you can tell what I think, okay? <laughs> I'm not buying that one. Uh, also, that view did not, we'll see this in a minute, but that did, view did not really take full shape until the Middle Ages, actually around the 1500s. Um, so this was a new idea, this purgatory. And this is a place where your sins are paid off over time. And they debate about how long that is and how you pay them off and all that kind of stuff. Um, but basically, purgatory is where you go when you die. Even if you're a really good believer, you probably have unconfessed sin. So you have to go satisfy God's wrath for that sin. Because in this view, all sins must be paid for in some way. Uh, so you, everybody goes there. And then based on <laughs> who you're talking to, uh, different views come up about how you pay off your sin there. Like apparently, you're, you know, in the Middle Ages, your loved ones could pay money to the church and then the priest could kind of set your loved one free from purgatory somehow. He must have had a real cool phone that connected to purgatory. I'm not sure how all that worked, but um, that's one of the things the reformers hated. The Protestant view is <laughs> take your pick. <laughs> I'll just be honest. Um, the Protestants, which is what we all are, nobody's Catholic in here, right? Nobody's Eastern Orthodox? Okay, then you're Protestant. Welcome. <laughs> um, so 
there's all kinds of views about this. There are groups that believe in soul sleep, which is when we die, our, we are unconscious uh, until the resurrection. And there are some cults, kind of some spinoff cults that teach that and believe that. Some, you know, Christian Protestants uh, believe some form of that. And there's a, a huge variety of views. So if you, you just pick a church. They'll tell you one way, go two blocks down the street, go to another church. They'll probably have a different idea of the intermediate state. That's kind of how it works. But generally speaking, the Protestant view is that when you die, you immediately go to heaven or hell. And then eventually you're going to be resurrected, so you get out of either of those places and get a new body, and then you go right back into where you were. That's, in general, uh, the Protestant view. So it's a little more complex than you might have thought. Yes? Okay. The question is, which one is right? I don't know, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll kind of give you some indications as we go. Here's some other terms. Universalism. You ever heard of universalism? You've heard of Universal Studios, but not universalism probably. This is the view that all people will be saved in the end. Now, I hope that's true, but it's not. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong in that that's true, because I would love for all people to be saved, wouldn't you? You just thought of a few of your enemies, and you're like, I don't know, everybody? Like, what about Hitler, you know, stuff like that. What about that person that fired me that time? Um, but universalism, and by the way, they were very ancient uh, Christians, who toyed around with this idea a little bit. One guy was named Origen, and um, he was condemned for his teaching on this topic. He really started developing this idea that he thought eventually all people would be saved. You may go to hell for a while and be you know, kind of punished for the things you did in this life, but ultimately you're all going to turn to Christ and everybody's going to be saved. Um, but historically that's been called heresy and uh, still is today. The other view, these two have to do with uh, hell. Eternal conscious torment, or ECT. This is what probably is the majority view in the, uh, in the West. Those who go to hell will be tormented for, with fire endlessly, right? That's kind of the popular view. This means that they are eternally alive and suffering forever. So you go to hell and you have eternal life, but it's an eternal suffering life, Okay. Now, the other uh, view is called conditional immortality. This view says that your soul are, is not immortal on its own. Okay, the, And by the way, let me take a break here and just tell you this. The idea that all souls are immortal, like flat out, all souls live forever somewhere, that idea originated with Greek philosophers in the intertestament period. It does not come from the Bible. The Bible clearly has places where it talks about a soul being destroyed or dying. Okay, So the idea that all souls live forever somewhere actually comes from pagan Greek philosophers, not from the Bible. But the conditional immorality, uh, Im immorality immortality, uh, they say that a soul only lives forever if God grants it eternal life, which means to be saved, right, to have eternal life. Evil spirits are tormented forever in hell, while human souls are burnt up and destroyed. Those who go to hell are destroyed there, and that's it. So they're not being tortured endlessly for all time. That's the third view here. Am I making any sense? Okay. I'm just trying to give you the kind of the landscape. So let's talk about church history a little bit, and then we'll come back to that issue about hell. First, let's talk about that intermediate state. What did people believe throughout history? Well, let's start in the first century. So this is the time uh, of Christ. When uh, Jesus arrives on the scene, you just need to understand this. This will help you in interpreting the New Testament. There is not one form of Judaism when Jesus walks on this earth. There are multiple forms. So we already know about a few, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees are the liberals. They're in bed with Rome. They only read the Torah, and everything after Deuteronomy is not Scripture for the Sadducees. They don't believe any of the prophets, any of the historical books, none of that. It's only the Torah. They don't believe in any afterlife. There's no soul. There's no spirits. There's no angels. There's no demons. There's no resurrection. That's why they're always sad, you see. You can't, you can't go without telling that joke. I'm sorry. Right? So they were, but they were also the most powerful people in Jerusalem because they controlled the temple. 
So the money changers and all that that's going on in the temple that Jesus kind of rails against and flips their tables over and all that, the Sadducees had set that system up, and they were wealthy because of it. They also own most of the land in Israel because they'd basically taken it from their own people. Um, so the Sadducees are a mess. That's about the best way to put it. Then there's the Pharisees, and they're kind of a mess too, but in the other direction. They're the super conservatives. Uh, they, they love all the Old Testament and all the rules they added to the Old Testament. I mean, they were rule people, right? So you got the Pharisees, but at least they believed that there was an afterlife and there was a resurrection, okay? So if you were to ask which group does Jesus identify more with, it would actually be the Pharisees. He was definitely against what the Sadducees were teaching. Uh, Jesus, he teaches us a little bit about how he understood this, or at least how he knew everyone else understood it. Uh, they believe that, um, at least the Pharisees and groups like them, they believe uh, he teaches this story. Some, sometimes it's called a parable. There's debate about whether it's a parable or not. Um, the only thing that makes it different from the other parables is a, the name of a person, Lazarus. Everything else in that story reads just like a parable. So I'll let you figure out what you want to do with that. But he tells this story, and we're, we'll read it in depth later, um, where both of these people go to Hades upon their death, but Lazarus goes to the good side because there's a separation between the righteous and the unrighteous, and the good side is called like Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom, sometimes it's called, uh, other times it's called paradise, okay? Um, so there's two compartments here, and the rich man is being punished, and he's like, you know, begging for a drop of water and all that, and he's actually talking to Abraham across this big gap. And uh, Abraham, in this story, tells him, you know, well, I can't do that because the gap's too big. I can't just jump across there, and you can't come over here. That's how this works. Um, so Lazarus, though, he's in a good place. He's in the paradise side of it because, you know, he's, he's been tormented his whole life already. Uh, and the rich man only cared about himself. So Jesus set it up this way, and the, that story that he's telling was the majority view uh, of that day, and it stayed that way for a very, very long period of time. So um, that's first century. The church fathers, and we're going to cover a thousand years of history right here uh, because there wasn't a whole lot of variation on this. They basically followed what Jesus taught in the rich man and Lazarus story. They said that's the way it is. So even if you're a Christian or if you're a non-believer, Everybody goes to the same place and awaits the resurrection, and there's a separation between the good and the evil in that place. So if you read the rich man and Lazarus story, the early church believed that's the way it is until the resurrection. Okay, All the dead go to Hades first. Those who have done good in their earthly life are rewarded with a preview of eternal life in paradise. Those who have done evil will be punished with a preview of the lake of fire. I'm using the word preview there kind of in quotes. They may not use that term, but... That's kind of what they mean. This was the teaching for over a thousand years of church history. I read a bunch of quotes, and obviously I didn't have enough time to read everybody, but I read a lot of different quotes from different centuries, and it seems to me that that was the majority view for most of church history. Okay? <clears throat> uh, the early church fathers, um, I'll, just, I'll give you a couple quotes here. There's more in your notes. Justin Martyr, he, he's writing around 160. He said, you may have fallen in with some, and he's talking about this heretical group called the Gnostics, um, who are called Christians. He's implying that they're really not. Uh, however, they do not admit this intermediate state, uh, and they venture to blaspheme, blaspheme the God of Abraham. They say that there is no resurrection of the dead. Rather, they say that when they die, their souls are taken to heaven. Do not imagine that they are Christians. So he's very clear that people who think that there's no intermediate state, that you just die and you go straight to heaven, he says that's heresy and it comes from a heretical group. And if you read in context, he's talking about the Gnostics. Um, quick crash course on Gnosticism. Uh, they start out as kind of a Christian-ish group, but they believe that all physical things are evil and only spiritual things are good. So your body is something you need to get out of. They also believe that the creator in the Old Testament was evil because he created a physical world because the physical world's evil. You see the circular reasoning here? And that when Jesus comes on the scene and he talks about his father, 
his you know, God the Father, that's a different God than the Creator. That's what the Gnostics believe. And he's the good God, and the Creator's the bad God, and that's why they want to believe that you die and you get out of your body and you never have a body again. You're in a good spirit place, right? So that's what Justin Martyr is railing against uh, in this, this part. He's saying that we don't, we don't buy in with that camp. Irenaeus is another guy around 180. He says, The Lord went away in the midst of the shadow of death where the souls of the dead were. He's talking about when Jesus died and he went down into Hades, right? However, afterwards, he arose in the body, and after the resurrection, he was taken up into heaven. That's the ascension, right? From this, it is clear that the souls of the disciples also, upon whose account the Lord underwent these things, will go away into the invisible place allotted to them by God, and they will remain there until the resurrection, awaiting that event. Then receiving their bodies and rising in their entirety, that is bodily, just as the Lord arose, they will come in that manner into the presence of God. Now, do you see just from that quote why it's difficult to read what early Christians wrote? <laughs> That's just one paragraph of multitudes of stuff. Um, so it, you have to really slow down and think about what they're saying. But Irenaeus is basically telling you that what we see Jesus doing, he dies, he goes to Hades for a time, he rises, and he ascends. He says, we're going to follow that same example. That's how he saw it. So this is how they, this, is, this would be their chart, even though they didn't make charts back then. Uh, you have earthly life, you die. There's an intermediate state. You have Hades and Paradise. It's basically one location, but it's separate, right? Uh, and that's a preview of your eternity until the resurrection when we all receive uh, a body and we receive one that's incorruptible and imperishable, which means it can't die, Right? Okay, that's what we receive, and we go to the new creation, not heaven, new creation, and new heavens and a new earth is what John sees in uh, Revelation 21, 22, right? And it, if you read that passage, it sounds a lot like the Garden of Eden, except there's no night there, which means there's no time. It's ongoing forever, right? So the the outcome, the our eternity, if you're a believer, is... Sorry, if you're faithful to Jesus, uh, your, your future's in new creation. And that's life, eternal life. The lake of fire is called the second death. So you're going to die. If you're an unbeliever, you're going to die. And then you're going to have an intermediate period. And then you're going to be resurrected and judged. And then there's the second death. Okay? So you get to die twice. And follow Jesus. You don't have to worry about any of that. Right? So... This is how the early Christians saw it, and this is how they saw it for over a thousand years, okay? Now, I'm not telling you what to think. I'm just telling you what the information is, okay? In the Middle Ages, though, the Western church, that's the church that went Latin and left the Greek. The New Testament was written in what language? Greek, right. The Eastern church kept reading it in Greek. The uh, Western side went Latin, and that becomes a Roman Catholic church. They begin to define their doctrine of purgatory. By the 1200s, the Catholic Church is affirming purgatory at their church council. So it's an official doctrine by the 1200s. By the 1500s, they've worked out a bunch of their details. And wow, you just don't even want to go study this. There's so many things that they think they figured out. Okay, The length of time, there's different arguments about how long are you there before you get to pay off your sins. There's arguments about is it a physical place or spiritual by the way, the official position today of the Catholic Church is that it is a, it is a physical space, um, not a spiritual space, even though your spirit is what goes there, but that's nonetheless, whatever. Um, then there's debates about how the living can help the dead pay off their sins in purgatory, usually involving giving money to the church, uh, or saying prayers and saying Hail Marys and saying all kinds of stuff to try to somehow affect their salvation from their sins and purgatory. And there's a bunch of more stuff that I don't have time to talk about, nor do I want to talk about it, because uh, it's real simple if you just say purgatory was made up in the Middle Ages. So I'm going with that, whatever. If you're online and you're Catholic, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just trying to be honest. Um, this doctrine really didn't exist uh, until around the Middle Ages. The foundational idea behind purgatory is the Latin view, the Western view, that God's wrath for sin must be satisfied. 
So God's mad about sin, and because he's a just God, he cannot let any sin go unpunished. Now notice what I just said. I just said God cannot do something. Anytime your view says God can't do something, you might want to rethink some things, okay? Because that's putting God in a box, right? So, um, so basically all unconfessed sins must be punished with fire so that it can purify you enough to satisfy God's justice and you can be accepted into his presence. Okay, that's purgatory. The Eastern Church, the Greek people who stuck with the Greek New Testament, they rejected all of this. That view of justice, that view of God's wrath needing to be satisfied, and purgatory, the Eastern Church never bought into any of that. They said it was made up. We don't believe things that are just made up, right? Then the Reformation happened. The Reformers rejected purgatory and the Eastern view. So the Reformers said, all y'all are wrong. And uh, the Reformers loved uh, to do that. If you read their writings, they pretty much believed everybody was wrong with, but them. Uh, they rejected purgatory and the Eastern view, and they added the word immediately to every time when, when um, like the Apostle Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? They added the word immediately into that. That's not in the passage. So they tried to speed up the intermediate state and say there really isn't one. <laughs> Right? It's just going to be an immediate heaven or hell. Right? Um, upon death, people are immediately with Christ in heaven or with the wicked in hell. That was the Reformed view that permeates to, to today, especially in the West. Now, the question is, what does the Bible say about all these things? Now, what we're going to do for the next few minutes is we're just going to read a few passages. There's a ton of stuff we could talk about, a bunch of passages we could go through, I'm just going to pick a few to try to help us understand a few things uh, because we can't do everything in one night. Um, you're almost asleep as it is. So, Y'all still with me? All right, let's actually read what Jesus did in this rich man and Lazarus story. He says, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. That's, that's, that's pretty uh, lavish lifestyle, like, I know it looks like I feast every day, but I don't, right? Um, probably most days, but not every day. Uh, so this guy, man, he's, he's eating a lot of food. Remember, this is, this is ancient. We're in the first century when he's telling this story. So feasting every day would have been filthy rich, right? And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, because if you were poor back then, you didn't go like to the local welfare office and get a check from the government. They didn't have that. If you were poor, you begged. That's how it worked, if, especially if you didn't have a family member to help you out. So Lazarus is laying there at the rich man's gate, which is a wonderful place to be laying if you need someone to give you some money. Go to a guy who's got so much money, he's overeating every day. And he's covered with sores, so he's also got some kind of disease, like leprosy or something. And he desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Lazarus is not asking for money. He's just asking for crumbs. Give me the food you're going to throw away after the meal. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. That's a, bad, that's a pretty big contrast between the rich man and Lazarus. right? It's like the highest high and the lowest low. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. Now, before we read on, just understand, everybody listening to this story, when Jesus was telling it, understood exactly what he was talking about, because they all understood that everybody went to Hades, and there was two compartments, and they understood that one was called Abraham's side, or paradise, and that the Old Testament faithful saints were there waiting for their resurrection, and the wicked were on this other side, and they were experiencing suffering. Everybody listening to Jesus already believed this. So there was nothing shocking, okay? Maybe not nothing, but not a lot shocking. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off at Lazarus' side, and Lazarus at his side. So apparently, you can look across there and see people having a good old time. And you're not having a good old time, right? And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Now, look at the arrogance of this rich man. Send Lazarus 
the guy who I neglected my whole life and his whole life, who sat out there with dogs licking his leprosy, and I wouldn't even give him the crumbs off my table. Get him and tell him to do something for me. We often miss that part of the story. This, so here's what we know. This guy is in the bad side of Hades, being tormented, and he still hasn't changed, has he? Okay, so that should give you an indication about what kind of people end up on the bad side of this deal. It's people that won't even change when they're being punished for what they've been in this life. So, so get Lazarus and get, like, treat him like my servant over here. Get him to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. So they thought of it, there's a big gap between these two places, and it's water, right? But Abraham said, Oh, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to here. None shall pass. Right? You're, we can't, that's not how this works, rich man. <laughs> you don't get to call out over here and get some guy you neglected his whole life to come give you some water. That's not how this works. You're there. We're here. Deal with it. That's the harsh way paraphrase of what Abraham just said. Let's look at Matthew 3. So that, that was what Jesus said, and he never said any of that changed. That's just a story he tells. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. Now this is where we're going to kind of shift from intermediate state to what do we think about hell? What does the Bible say about hell? All right. This is John the Baptist describing what Jesus is coming to do. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, if you're Pentecostal, you think that fire part's a good thing. I'm not sure anybody listening to this thought being baptized with fire was a good thing. Because it had happened in the Old Testament and the people were destroyed when that happened. So... It might be that he's saying he's going to baptize those who are faithful with the Holy Spirit and those who are wicked with fire. Seems to be what he's about to say here. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And that word there literally in Greek is burn up, destroy, with unquenchable fire. So the fire burns forever, but what gets thrown in it is burn up, okay? So if you're in the conditional immortality thinking, you, you would take this verse and say, yes, the fire is eternal, but what's thrown in there gets burned up, and that's it, all right? Uh, Matthew ten twenty eight, Jesus says, do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. That seems to imply the soul could be killed. He says, don't fear ones who can kill, don't fear humans who can kill your body but not your soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That seems to be saying, Jesus, that's Jesus' words. He seems to be saying that God can destroy your soul in hell. The word for destroy is apolumi, which means literally to perish or destruction. It never means to live on in suffering. It means to be destroyed uh, in, in the Scripture. And the word for hell here is the word Gehenna. All right? So take that in consideration. Matthew 13, The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. This is the return of Christ. Uh, by the way, notice who's being gathered out. Sinners and lawbreakers, not the church. Anyway, that's, that was a little leftover from last week about the end times. Um, they gathers out of his kingdom all sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. 
Now, the reason I brought this up is that phrase, gnashing of teeth. A lot of people think that means pain and suffering. The phrase gnashing of teeth in your Bible is a reference to anger and indignation. Outside the Bible, in ancient Greek literature, gnashing of teeth always means hatred and anger. It's growling at someone. I'll give you an example. When uh, Stephen in the book of Acts gives his, his long kind of speech slash independent fundamental Baptist sermons, what it kind of sounds like is he's like, you killed the author of life, you stiff-necked people, you always resist the Holy Spirit. And then they stoned him to death, right? Uh, it says that they gnashed their teeth at him. So that clearly doesn't mean they were suffering. It means, or they were burning in flames. It means they were in hatred towards Stephen, and you can see how much they hated him because they killed him, right? He was the first martyr uh, in the book of Acts. So weeping is sadness. Gnashing of teeth is anger. So here's how I think about this. When you ask the question, what kind of people are going to, to be thrown into the lake of fire? All right, It's people who, when they get there, they would still hate God. They would gnash their teeth at. They're the enemies of God. They hate God, which is why they're there, because they don't want anything to do with God, and God will give you what you want. If you don't want him, you don't have to be with him. He's not going to force that on you. Just realize that if you don't want to be with him, you are going to be away from life. And that's it for you. And uh, I just don't want to be God's enemy. That doesn't turn out well ever. <laughs> All right? So I just want to clear that up. Gnashing of teeth is not pain and suffering. It's anger, hatred. Matthew 25, this is when this is uh, part of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew's Gospel, and he's talking about the return, the final return of Christ. He says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. So this is Judgment Day, right? All the nations gathered before him. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Kind of makes you wonder, like, man, it seems like goats are the bad guys, you know. Melvin probably thinks, yeah, I hate goats. He's got a few at his house right now. Um, and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. So if you ever have a question, should I be on the right or the left? Whew, went right over your head there. I was kind of making a political joke, but y'all missed it. So he placed the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, uh, let me, hang on, just for the people online, I'm not saying Democrats go to hell. That's not what I just said, okay? I was making a stupid joke because everybody was way too quiet in here, okay? Um, but if you do ask my opinion, um, the way the left is going today is very unchristian and I can't go with them. So let's put that to bed. Anyway, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Hold on a second. The kingdom is being prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Doesn't that imply that God really loves his people? Right? That he's been working on this, and he could just speak it into existence, but he's been preparing this since the foundation of the world. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Right? And when I come again, I will take you to be where I am. All right? So the, he's going to separate the, uh, the sheep and the goats. And I'm, I'm kind of skipping ahead here for sake of time. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. What was hell created for? The devil and his angels. What Jesus just said is, it's not God's, it's not God's intention that any human end up there. It was not created for us. However, you can go there if you like. And these will go in, away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So that's what Jesus said about it. So here's what we can be sure of. There is a judgment day. There will be a separation. There will be people who inherit a, uh, a kingdom, a paradise, a new creation. 
there will people be people who have rejected him their whole life and hate God, and they will end up in eternal fire. The fire, for sure, is eternal. Now, whether you are there or not is up for debate, maybe, but the fire, for sure, is not going out. Yes? So here's that we can be sure about what Jesus just said, okay? Let's jump forward to Revelation 19. Uh, we're getting close to being done. Uh, this is describing one of the, the final battle, and he says, and the beast was captured. Remember, if you've read Revelation, there's all this stuff about the beast, right? There's actually more than one or two. Uh, the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and on those who worshipped its image. So the beast and the false prophet had been working together to deceive uh, humans into worshipping this beast. Right, These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword. And it kind of reads on and talks about some more details there. But So the beast and the false prophet, in the end, are they're thrown into the lake of fire. If we read on in chapter 20, this is a, you know the final battle that happens. It's another description of it. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, the people who believe in eternal conscious torment love to bring this verse up and say, see right here, tormented day and night forever. But who's being tormented day and night forever? Uh, Satan and demons. Okay. There's no humans in the lake of fire yet. He hasn't talked about them yet because judgment day hasn't happened yet in Revelation, right? So that's who's being tormented day and night forever. In your New Testament, there isn't a verse that says humans are tormented day and night forever. It's actually only right here, and it's talking about the demonic spirits and their leader. Then I saw a great, great, a great, a great, White throne, say that real fast. And him who was seated on it, and from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. So the old creations passed away, right? And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, it was called the Book of Life. If you go back and read the book of Daniel, you'll see the same kind of language. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done not according to what they believed or said they believed, according to what they had done. This is repeated all throughout the New Testament, right? And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. So that tells you right there that Hades is not hell. The lake of fire is hell, right? Hades is thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And it says nothing about how what they experienced there. It's just implied. You're going into fire. What happens when you throw stuff in the fire? It burns up, right? Now, I'm not telling you what to think. I'm telling you how people read these passages is what I'm doing right now. So here's the conclusion, and then we can have some Q&A time. The intermediate state seems to be a preview of our eternal destination. That's what the church has historically uh, believed. We should be careful, though, not to be too dogmatic in our views about what we will experience in the intermediate state. And for that matter, we should be careful how we talk about what we know about heaven and hell and the new creation because we're not given enough information to have a fully worked out idea of what goes on there. Um, And I'll just, let me just say this. Um, I often hear people in America, preachers in America, go into great detail about what hell will be like or about what heaven will be like. And almost every time, they're not reading it from the Bible. It's just speculation. But most people sitting in churches don't know that. Because they think preachers are basically telling you what the Bible says. But we're not always telling you what the Bible says. Sometimes we mess up and tell you what we think. (laughs) Right? So be careful with big elaborate explanations of what hell is like or what heaven is like if Scripture's not tied to it. 
So if somebody tells you, oh, no, hell's going to be like this, you need to say, where'd you find that in the Bible? Because we, if it's not coming from Scripture, I, I, we could just believe anything. You know? so, so be careful about, it, about these things. Now, we can be sure that our eternal home is not in heaven. How can we be sure of that? Well, read the end of the book of Revelation. It's very clear we're not, our eternal home is not in heaven. Our eternal home is in a new earth a new creation, okay? And God will be with us there, so it will be heaven in that sense. It will, we will be in God's perfect presence, and it won't burn us up like it did some people who burst into the Holy of Holies in the book of Leviticus, and God's presence burned them up, consumed them. Because we will be in a new body without sin, no guilt. We will be able to be in God's perfect presence, and it won't kill us. So it's a new creation, so that's our eternal home. Um, we can be sure that the enemies of God, both spiritual and human, will end up in the lake of fire. The Bible clearly tells us that's the destination for the enemies of God. Whatever punishment experienced there will fit the crime. Now, I can't exactly tell you exactly how all that's going to work in the lake of fire, but I can tell you this, it will fit their hatred toward God. The punishment will fit the crime because I believe our God is just and he will do what is right for all people. And some people who hate God and want to end up away from him will. Right? Now, no matter what our views of the afterlife, the Bible is clear that remaining faithful to Christ is the highest priority. Yes? Okay, so... If you believe you're going to be tortured forever in hell, fine. If you believe you're just going to burn up in hell, fine. I'm going to be faithful to Jesus and I don't have to find out. To me, that seems to be the point of what Jesus was teaching, right? <laughs> There's a lake of fire. Well, what's it going to be like? Well, if you just be faithful to me, you don't have to worry about that, <laughs> right? Now, us Westerners don't like that because we want to have all our stuff figured out. We don't want any question unanswered. The Eastern church is completely different. They're okay with mystery. They're okay. If you, if you ask an Eastern Orthodox guy, um, well, exactly how is the punishment going to work in hell? Is there degrees of punishment? Are you going to burn up? Or are you just going to burn forever? And how does that work if, you're, if it's not eternal life, but you're eternally lived? If you ask them these questions, they'd be like, well, that's not the point. We don't know. We hadn't been there. You shouldn't be plaguing yourself with these questions. You should be asking, how can you be more faithful to Jesus so you don't end up there to begin with? So that's the point. That's our highest priority. Amen? Kids are about to tear the room down over there if I don't get done. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to hurry. So here, here's kind of the point for tonight, all right? And like I said at the beginning, there's much more that we could have done with this topic. We just didn't have time to get through it all. We can always come back to it. You know, if Jesus doesn't come back, we're going to have another Wednesday night in the future where we can keep uh, talking about these things. But the main point I wanted you to see is that it's not as simple as a lot of people in America make it sound. There's more to it than that. Some terms have been mistranslated in your English Bible, and it confuses a lot of the issues. The main thing we need to understand is not that we need to have every detail of our theology worked out. The main point is to understand this. We must be faithful to Jesus in this life. This life affects the next one. Yes? Okay? So that's number one. Uh, number two is <clears throat> if you don't end up in hell, you don't have to worry about what happens there. How do you not end up in hell? See number one. <laughs> Stay faithful to Jesus and let God work out eternal rewards and punishment. Because here's the deal. Whatever you think won't matter when it happens. On judgment day, we'll find out how wrong we were about a lot of things. And like I said, I've said this numerous times, and I'll keep saying it. I don't mind repeating myself. You know that. On Judgment Day, you're not going to be asked whether you were eternal conscious torment or annihilationism or universalism. You're not going to be asked any of that. It's going to be, were you faithful to Christ to the best of your ability in your life? 
That's going to be the question. And then after that, we can ask Jesus what we should have believed. We'll be able to go, hey, Jesus, we're, what were we thinking about this? And he'll, he'll probably, I, here's what I think is going to go. I think Jesus was funny on, on many occasions. I think he's going to laugh at us a lot. That's going to be part of the enjoyment for me. I think it's going to be great to watch Jesus laugh at our stupid theology we came up with. And we can just laugh about it. And, and you know, Apostle Paul's going to be sitting over there going, yeah, y'all really screwed this up. <laughs> you know, Peter's going to be sitting over there going, y'all are just like me, you're saying stupid stuff all the time, right? You know, look, we don't have to have all this figured out. We can have mystery. We can accept the fact that his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts higher than all, our thoughts, and we're not going to figure it all out. Let's just be faithful to Jesus and quit arguing over things we can't understand anyway. Amen? So that's my, that's kind of the, the end of my afterlife crash course <laughs> uh, on, on that. Um, so let's talk about next week real quick. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts next week. There's all kinds of questions about that, and a lot of denominations divide over these spiritual gifts uh, questions, so we're going to talk about that. You know, what's this whole speaking in tongues thing? You know, why I went to one person's church, and somebody hit them on the head, and they fell out, and what's that whole deal? We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about the gift of prophecy, because there's a awful lot of YouTube prophets nowadays, and um, boy, it's been fun to watch them all be wrong the last few years. I don't know that that should be fun for me. It's a guilty pleasure of mine, I'll just be honest. Uh, when they all prophesied that Trump was going to win, and then he didn't, and all those people kept being prophets. And that's hilarious to me because the Old Testament flat out says if they're, they say something is from God and they're wrong, they're not a prophet. So you know, fold up your ministry and go home, but let's not preach the whole thing right now. That's next week. Uh, so we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. We'll also get into a little bit of the history of Pentecostalism and charismatic uh, practices. We're going to talk about some of that stuff. You might be surprised to know the history of some of that. Um, I do want to say this, though, and then I'm going to stop. All right. Next week, I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I'll show you from the Scripture what I believe about it. But I in no way am throwing rocks at our Pentecostal or charismatic brothers and sisters. All right, I will tell you this. Here's what I think about Pentecostals. Uh, the Baptists need to learn a few things from them about being excited for Christ and be excited about worship. We need to learn that. And the Pentecostals need to learn a few things from the Baptists about actually reading the Bible sometimes. Sometimes you've got to quit having dreams and prophecies and read what Jesus said. So there's an extreme. There are two extremes, and we need to meet more in the middle. So that's a little preview of what we're going to talk about next week, but I want to be very clear, we're not going to be critical, we're just going to deal with some truth from history and scripture, um, because you all have a gift. In Christ, you're all gifted with something, and we're going to discover what those things are and how important they are and how important it is for you to be using your gift faithfully, because the church needs you. That'll be next week.